We have been covering the war in Ukraine extensively ever since the unprovoked full-scale invasion ordered by Putin on the 24th of February 2022. However, the war in Ukraine actually started much earlier in 2014, when the Kremlin-backed separatists started occupying administrative buildings and weapon caches in eastern Ukraine, prompting the nascent and disorganized post-revolutionary government in Ukraine to order the anti-terrorist operation. Soon, processes spiraled out of control, leading to a war in Donbass, the starting point of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In this video, we will discuss the regional war in the Donbass region of Ukraine, the eight-year prelude to the full-scale invasion of 2022. We hope to give people as much information as possible on this conflict to make it easier to understand, though we also have a special offer to hand out from a service that does the opposite. It's our sponsor Incogni, a service that hunts down all the information about you and your life that exists online and deletes it. We don't mean something like social media profiles. You probably already know that your data is recorded by just about anyone you give it to because it's worth money. Your credentials are bought and sold by data brokers without your involvement, which quickly becomes a problem. Perhaps it will be as little as spam calls or texts. Perhaps people will take out loans in your name or use your details for their false identities. Or in the worst cases, the data is used to identify you and your home for stalking or criminal acts. Technically, you have the power to ask data brokers to not do this, but it's not easy, and whenever they remove your records, they will probably just scrape it again from all the sites you visit shortly after. So that's why Incogni provides two main services, one to go through the process of getting hundreds of records involving you deleted, and two, delete the new ones as they pop up. Check it out at incogni.com slash kingsandgenerals, and you'll also get 60% off an annual plan. It's easy, automated, and these days, essential. Check it out now. Ever since Putin began his reign, the imperialist geopolitical worldview has gradually restored its position in Russia. In this worldview, Ukraine is not an independent country, but merely a quasi-state created by Western meddling and the grave mistakes of Soviet leaders, who allowed it to exist as a Union Republic within the Soviet Union. Even though Ukraine became independent from Russia following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Many in the Russian elite continued seeing it as the proverbial prodigal son who would return to Mother Russia sooner or later. Hence, attempts in Ukraine to choose a pro-Western course of development, as they did in the 2004 Orange Revolution, were seen by Putin and his clique purely as Western interference in its sphere of influence, and not as the aspiration of the Ukrainian people, or at least its majority. In the worldview of Putin and his nationalist circle, Ukrainians and many other formerly subjugated peoples do not have agency, they can merely act as a tool of great powers. While Russo-Ukrainian relations worsened significantly in the aftermath of the Orange Revolution, the turning point came 10 years later, when the Revolution of Dignity, also known as Euromaidan, ousted the corrupt President Yanukovych. Once again, Putin saw this development as meddling in his sphere of influence, but this time, he decided to act with military intervention. Taking advantage of the post-revolutionary turmoil in Ukraine, Russia annexed Crimea on March 26, following a sham referendum conducted in the presence of Russian troops. Even though their presence in Crimea was obvious, Putin intended to create an illusion that this was not interference by Russia, but an organic process. In reference to accusations of the presence of Russian troops, Putin simply said, Iktamnyet, they are not there. Putin had no intention to stop at Crimea. His next target was Donbass, a predominantly Russian-speaking region in eastern Ukraine. Donbass was one of the most heavily industrialized regions of the USSR, and the collapse of the Soviet Union led to the decline of industry in the region and harmed the living conditions of the people there. This caused some degree of nostalgia for the good old days of the Soviet Union, particularly among the older population. Simultaneously, a local oligarchy, said to be heavily connected with criminal elements in Donbass, started becoming the region's most influential political, economic and societal force. They took over most of the industry, started involvement in politics, and actively stirred an anti-Ukrainian mood, positioning themselves as defenders of the people of Donbass, who were ignored by the Ukrainian government. This process eventually morphed into the emergence of the Party of the Regions, 
a pro-Russian party with Donbass as its electoral stronghold. The party of the regions quickly entered the mainstream of Ukrainian politics, despite many shady characters in its ranks. This party took the mantle of a moderate pro-Russian political force conveniently different from Donbass's most marginal and radical elements, who demanded immediate secession of the region and joining Russia. But this did not stop pro-Russian propaganda and the stoking of anti-Ukrainian sentiment in eastern Ukraine, even though, albeit slowly, the mood was swinging towards pro-Ukrainian sentiments, especially among the younger population. Hence, when the Euromaidan was raging in Kyiv, many people had not attended anti-Maidan protests in eastern Ukraine cities. But Russian operatives annexing Crimea and heavily infiltrating eastern Ukrainian cities changed this situation. In the spring of 2014, when the Ukrainian government had still not solidified its grip on power, many eastern Ukrainian cities saw Russian-orchestrated attempts at occupying administrative buildings and buildings of police and security, which hosted weapon caches. In the city of Dnipro, formerly known as Dnipropetrovsk, pro-Ukrainian activists reacted to calls of pro-Russian groups to occupy local administrations by doing it first and then passing on their control to the newly appointed governor of the city, well-known oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky, who remained loyal to Kyiv. In Kharkiv, pro-Russian protesters took over the city administration and flew the Russian flag for 45 minutes on March 1st. The person who raised the flag was a Russian from Moscow. The Kharkiv city administration was captured once again on April 6th, while similar events in Donetsk and Luhansk played out simultaneously, indicating orchestration by an outside force. But unlike in Donetsk and Luhansk, in Kharkiv, the Ukrainian special forces quickly cleaned up the building on April 7th within 15 minutes, without firing a single shot. The intricacies of internal relations between various groups of the Ukrainian political elite in 2014 deserves a story of its own, but without going into detail, we can say that the personal participation of the Minister of Defense, Arsen Avakov, who lived in Kharkiv and was the head of its administration during Yushchenko's tenure, and calculations of the shifty mayor of Kharkiv from the party of the regions, Kernis, prevented any further escalation in this city. One of the more tragic events of this period took place in Odessa on March 2nd, when dozens of pro-Russian activists were burned alive in the House of Union, which was a testimony to the extreme tensions going on in Ukraine at the time. However, the most consequential events leading to war occurred in Donetsk and Luhansk. On March 1st, several thousand people gathered in front of the Donetsk Regional Administration, expressing support for the Burkut Riot Police Unit, which engaged in violent suppression of the Euromaidan, and a referendum on the status of Donetsk Oblast, which effectively meant secession from Ukraine. The crowd soon took over the building without any interference from the police. Pro-Russian groups declared the creation of parallel structures of authority in Donetsk, essentially declaring themselves independent from Ukraine. But a few days later, the police removed them from the regional administration building under the pretext of detecting explosives in the building. But tensions in Donetsk continued. Pro-Russian groups continued their attempts to occupy buildings, while pro-Ukrainian groups organized demonstrations to support Ukraine's unity. Further escalation took place on April 6th, when pro-Russian groups occupied the Donetsk Regional Administration, the Luhansk Building of the Ukrainian Security Service SBU, and the aforementioned Kharkiv City Administration. Pro-Russian groups took hold of weapons in the Luhansk SBU building, effectively transitioning the events in Donbass into an armed conflict. The simultaneous occurrence of these events indicates at least some degree of orchestration. Recordings of phone calls between Putin's aide Glasiev and pro-Russian activists and Russian agents in Ukraine, leaked in 2016, clearly indicate organizational and financial support from Russia in the separatist movement in eastern Ukraine. Unlike in Kharkiv, the Ukrainian government did not conduct operations to clear administrative buildings from protesters. Special forces were deployed to both Donetsk and Luhansk, but they were never sent into action to retake the buildings, and were soon sent back. The Ukrainian government was hoping that it could solve the situation without bloodshed. They were also concerned that they would have to use force, which would give Putin a casus belli to invade Ukraine. They had good reason to be concerned about this, because as early as March 1st, 
the Russian Duma voted to give permission to Putin to use troops in Ukraine. Meanwhile, pro-Russian activists and Russian agents continued occupying administrative buildings in Donetsk, Luhansk, and other cities of Donbass. For instance, on April 15th, the police department of Halivka was captured by a group led by a Russian citizen named Igor Bezla, who studied at the Russian FSB Academy in the 1990s. A few days before that, on April 12th, a former FSB operative, Igor strokov gherkin arrested nine years later for becoming an angry patriot, led a group that captured the administrative authority buildings, SBU, and police in Slovyansk. This gave them access to weapons stored in those buildings. Similar events occurred in Kramatorsk, Mariupol, and other cities in eastern Ukraine. As strelkov gherkin later said, I pulled the trigger of the war. The new Ukrainian government had had enough and decided to put a stop to an almost unopposed process of armed secession of different cities and areas in Donbass. On April 13th, the acting president of Ukraine, Alexander Techenov, ordered an anti-terrorist operation in eastern Ukraine to regain control of all cities lost in Donbass. On April 15th, 2014, the war in Donbass started in earnest, when the Ukrainian special forces launched a successful assault to regain control of the Kramatorsk airfield. But on the next day, Ukraine suffered a setback when separatists captured several armoured vehicles of the 25th Brigade and sent them to Slovyansk. That same day, a separatist assault on a military base in Mariupol was repelled. The Geneva talks between the USA, the EU, Ukraine and Russia did nothing to solve the conflict. Separatists, whose control was initially limited to executive buildings, police and SBU stations in various cities and towns across Donbass, gradually expanded their control across the oblast. The lack of success of the conventional armed forces of Ukraine in stabilizing the situation prompted ordinary Ukrainians and former activists of Euromaidan to create volunteer battalions in order to fight back against the separatists. At a time of great turmoil in Ukraine, as was usual in post-revolutionary societies facing a foreign threat, most patriotic and nationalist forces came together first. This included the right sector group, Azov, Donbass and Idar battalions. Some members of these battalions had clear far-right tendencies and would be later accused of war crimes. These battalions would later be reformed and incorporated into the official structure of the Ukrainian armed forces. But far-right symbolism and imagery used by some of these groups and some of their soldiers damaged the international reputation of Ukraine. Obviously, separatist groups and Russian troops had their own fair share of Nazi sympathizers, but the Kremlin propaganda has capitalized on the aforementioned factor and ever since has been pushing the narrative that Nazi Ukrainians are killing Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine. In late April, the Ukrainian forces went on an offensive to liberate Slovyansk, but Russian-backed separatists managed to hold them back for a while. Battles were raging all over Donbass. Due to its strategic location as the port city of the Azov Sea, Mariupol was one of the key targets of the separatists. On May 7th, the Ukrainian National Guard liberated the building of the city administration from the separatists, only to lose it again on the same day. Further attempts by the Ukrainian forces to regain control of Mariupol from the Russian proxies in May failed. On May 11th, the separatists conducted sham referendums in Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, declaring the independence of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. One of the biggest shocks for Ukraine was the killing of 18 Ukrainian conscripts by the strelkov gherkin related group on May 22nd at a block post near Volnoverka. While regular skirmishes and battles were taking place throughout Donbass, many in Ukraine still thought that order would be restored quickly. This incident clearly demonstrated to ordinary Ukrainians that their country was now at war. The situation was also taking a bad turn for Ukraine in the Luhansk Oblast. On May 22nd, a group of Ukrainian servicemen defected to the separatist side near Lysychansk, causing a battle to ensue between the two sides. Separatists also tried to capture Svatovo, but were repelled by the Ukrainian army. On May 25th, one of the longest battles of the war in Donbass started, when the Vostok battalion, consisting of Russian soldiers and pro-Russian Ukrainians, commanded by Alexander Khodorkovsky, assaulted the Donetsk International Airport. Their first assault was defeated by the Ukrainian army, which used its air force for the first time in this war. 
but the second round of this battle would start several months later. By early June, the situation on the border with Russia in the Luhansk Oblast deteriorated for Ukraine. Kyiv had to evacuate several border checkpoints due to the inability to defend them, as they were captured by the separatists. Losing control over border areas was a disastrous development for Ukraine, since now Russia had the opportunity to send in troops and weapons whenever it pleased. On the other hand, the governance situation in Ukraine was stabilizing, as on June 7th, Petro Poroshenko was elected the president and vowed to defeat the separatists in the country. On June 13th, Ukraine restored control over Mariupol. This was followed by the liberation of Szczesia in Luhansk Oblast. But another shocking event for Ukraine took place on June 14th, when an IL-76 military cargo plane carrying 49 Ukrainian special forces was shot down near Luhansk. Particularly in the early months of the war, the nature of the warfare was chaotic and asymmetrical. Ukraine would succeed in cleaning a town from separatists somewhere in Donbass, only to see its soldiers ambushed, or a group of armed separatists taking over administrative buildings somewhere else. It was a war that was easier to fight for separatists, mixing conventional warfare with guerrilla-like tactics, than for the Ukrainian army, consisting mostly of poorly trained conscripts, in the absence of a clear line of contact and a fluid situation on the battlefield. In mid-June, Ukraine launched an ambitious operation to regain control of all border crossings with Russia, namely Uspenka, Marinivka, Belzhansky, Chivonopartizansk, and Isvarina. The goal was to cut any connection between separatist entities in Donbass and Russia, which was constantly sending supplies and troops to support their proxies. Elements of the 72nd Mechanized Brigade, the 79th Air Mobile Brigade, the 1st Tank Brigade, and other units with up to 3,000 soldiers, 50 tanks, and 200 armored vehicles were deployed during this operation, which aimed to re-establish Ukrainian control over a 150-kilometer-long land strip, which should have been followed by the creation of fortifications and strongholds along the border in preparation for any further incursion from the separatists and Russians. The operation was launched from Amvrasivka, but almost immediately, Ukrainian troops faced mortar shelling from Savomohyla, an elevation east of Donetsk close to the border with Russia. While the armored units advanced along the border, Ukrainian special forces were sent to liberate Savomohyla to cover their progress, where they were met with resistance from the Vostok battalion commanded by Khodorkovsky. The separatists constantly shelled the Ukrainian supply lines to Savomohyla, inflicting painful losses. On June 20th, the Ukrainian army defeated a large separatist force in the Battle of Yampil, fought with tanks and armored vehicles, which resulted in the liberation of Yampil and Sivirsk. Following that, Poroshenko proposed his peace plan and ordered Ukrainian troops to adhere to a week-long ceasefire in Donbass. Ukraine's president offered the separatists to lay down their arms or to go to Russia in exchange for guarantees of early local elections and official status for the Russian language in southeastern Ukraine. Poroshenko also proposed a 10-kilometer-long buffer zone on the Russo-Ukrainian border to ensure his plan was viable in its implementation. Predictably, the peace plan was rejected and hostilities resumed. On June 27th, the DPR separatists captured Sivirsk, which was followed by the capture of several Ukrainian military installations and police buildings in and around Donetsk in the following days. The failure of the ceasefire prompted the Ukrainian command to restart its operations along the border with Russia and Slovyansk in early July. On July 4th, the Ukrainians encircled Slovyansk and cut any contact between Strelkov Gherkin's group in the city and the rest of the separatist-controlled areas. The following day, the separatists managed to break through the Ukrainian encirclement with significant losses. They retreated to Kramatorsk first, but had to go all the way back to Donetsk and Holivka. After this, Gherkin's group lost control over Slovyansk, Kramatorsk, Bakhmut, Druzhkivka, and Konstantinovka. It was the first major victory of the Ukrainian army in this war, with the DPR separatists losing significant territory on their northern flank. Back in Donetsk, Gherkin appointed himself commandant of the city, which some interpreted as a coup d'etat within the unrecognized Donetsk People's Republic. He soon imposed a curfew on the territories he controlled. Following the success of this operation, the Ukrainian command decided to send a battalion from the 24th Brigade of its northern group to the group fighting along the border. 
However, the Ukrainian command failed to address the problem of the separatist artillery and mortars firing on the single highway along which the Ukrainian troops could move. Consequently, the Ukrainians began suffering heavy losses. Instead of launching their anticipated assault on Izvorina, the Ukrainian group had to scatter into smaller groups in open fields, amidst the threat of constant ambushes by mobile separatist groups. The separatists captured Marinivka and Stepanivka on July 16th, cutting the Ukrainian grouping along the border from its supplies and putting it in danger of complete destruction or surrender. At one point on July 26th, a group of Ukrainian soldiers were forced to cross the border into Russia and surrender. The Ukrainian command responded by sending reinforcements to break the encirclement of the southern grouping. On July 28th, Stepanivka was liberated, while on August 3rd, the Ukrainians finally pushed the separatists out of Severomohyla. However, the significantly weakened southern grouping was not in a position to complete the initial goals of the operation successfully, instead managing to break through towards Marinivka to link up with the rest of the Ukrainian units. In the process, the Ukrainians suffered further losses from mortar, artillery and grad shelling. The southern operation ended in a failure for the Ukrainian army, as the separatists expanded their area of control over the border. Meanwhile, on July 17th, Russia and its separatist proxies crossed all imaginable lines when they shot down a Boeing 777 flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. 283 passengers and 15 crew members died in this tragic incident. Initially, the separatists and Russia vehemently rejected any accusations and claimed that they did not possess any weapons to shoot down planes at such a high altitude. But further investigation showed that the plane was shot down with a Buk surface-to-air missile belonging to the Russian armed forces from an area controlled by the separatists in Donetsk Oblast. This incident led to some degree of toughening of sanctions against Russia by the US and EU, but the adequacy of the measures was nowhere near the scale of the crime. Russian proxies shot down a passenger plane, most probably mistaken for a Ukrainian military aircraft, but to this day the Kremlin rejects any responsibility for the tragedy. Even though the Ukrainian forces were encountering major problems in the south, they continued conducting successful operations in the north, as an assault was launched on separatists in Donetsk, while another attack was ongoing in Luhansk Oblast. On July 19th, the 95th Airmobile Brigade, supported by the 30th Mechanized Brigade and the Donbass Battalion, launched what would later be known as the Great Raid of 2014. Its purpose was to relieve the Ukrainian units trapped in the border area of Lahensk Oblast. The raid started out with the liberation of Lysychansk. It went on for three more weeks, as according to the official information from Ukraine, the 95th Brigade fought their way through for 470 kilometers destroying enemy equipment and positions to create a corridor for its trapped soldiers. By the end of July, Ukraine regained control over Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Rubizhna, Opazna, Dyboltseva, Shakhtarsk, Avdivka and Marienka. As the fighting reached Donetsk and its outskirts, battles became more costly for civilians on both sides of the line of contact. Since the fighting was mostly taking place in urban areas, the number of civilian casualties was rising. Neither side had precise munitions, which made shellings very risky, especially since the separatists often placed their artillery and mortars in heavily populated areas. Nevertheless, by early August, Ukrainian forces were slowly advancing around Donetsk. On August 9th, Strelkov Gherkin reported that the Ukrainian army took Krasny Luch of Lahansk Oblast under control, which put the separatist group in Donetsk and Holivka under an operational encirclement. At this point, the goal of the Ukrainian army was to encircle areas controlled by the separatists, particularly larger settlements. Its next goal was Ilovaisk, a railroad hub to the southeast of Donetsk. The separatists repelled the initial attack of the Donbass and Shakhtarsk battalions on the town on August 10th. On August 18th, volunteer battalions launched another assault on Ilovaisk and liberated the western part of the town, raising the Ukrainian flag over the city administration building. The Ukrainian army was now also engaged in operations inside Donetsk and Luhansk, which could have been a decisive blow to the separatist regimes in Donbass. Simultaneously, battles were ongoing for Holivka, Vulihersk, Savomohylia, Stepanivka, Yesenovata, Zdanivka, Stanitsya Luhanska, Pervomaisk, Makivka, and other towns and villages of Donbass. By then, 
Gherkin was removed from any leadership positions in Donetsk Oblast. Even though the Ukrainian forces were taking losses and experiencing significant resistance by the separatists, the situation looked bleak for the Russian proxies in Donbass. Obviously, this was not an acceptable scenario for Russia. Ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia has been inciting and participating in conflicts in different regions of the USSR as a tool to exert influence on warring sides. Eastern Ukraine was another one of these conflicts, and the program minimum for the Kremlin was to make sure that their proxies did not collapse under Ukrainian pressure. So, on August 25th, Russian forces, including a column of tanks and armoured vehicles, crossed the international border near Novoazovsk and shelled the Ukrainian forces in the area. While Russia continues to deny its involvement in the pre-2022 war in Ukraine, the general consensus is that the Novoazovsk operation was conducted by the Russian armed forces. Prior to their incursion, there were no separatist units anywhere close to Novoazovsk, and what artillery the separatists did have did not have the range to shell Ukrainian positions that far. The Venitsia Brigade of the Ukrainian army was routed and had to retreat to Mariupol. Now, the war in Donbass took a whole new turn. The Ukrainian army was facing not only the separatist forces, supported by men, equipment and supplies from Russia, but also the Russian army. Ukraine, which was making important progress before that, again lost momentum. Villages around Novozovsk were captured by the combination of Russian troops and separatists, putting Mariupol under imminent threat once again. Starobysheva and Savomo Hill were back under separatist control by August 27th. The situation was also deteriorating in and around Ilovaisk for the Ukrainian volunteer battalions. The Azov battalion was sent to the Novozovsk section to help deal with the Russian offensive, as the Ukrainian command reported about the arrival of Russian troops, later assessed at three battalion tactical groups, with 60 tanks to the Ilovaisk section. On the way to Ilovaisk, 10 Russian paratroopers of the 98th Airborne Division were captured. Still, Russia denied its involvement in the war, stating that these paratroopers had simply lost their way. Paratroopers are the cream of the crop of the Russian army, the most trained regular troops it has. Thinking that they've lost their way and travelled for 20 to 30 kilometers without understanding that they're in Ukraine? The Kremlin certainly thought that was believable. Remember, Iktamnyet. By August 27th, Ukrainian troops in Ulovaisk were encircled. Ukrainian command sent elements of the 92nd Mechanized Brigade to free the surrounding units, but they failed to accomplish their objective after encountering a heavy artillery barrage, followed by an assault from Russian paratroopers. On August 28th, Putin publicly called the separatists to give a humanitarian corridor to encircled Ukrainian units, pushing the propaganda narrative that he was an impartial mediator, even though he was the same man who started the war in Donbass. The Ukrainian command agreed to this proposal, and according to the OHCHR report, the Russian and separatist troops fired on Ukrainian vehicles with a visible white flag in the supposed humanitarian corridor. The Russians refute this claim, stating that despite the agreement, retreating Ukrainians were in possession of their weapons. Hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers were killed and wounded in this massacre. According to different sources, Ukraine lost somewhere between 500 and more than 1,000 soldiers in the Battle of Ilovaisk. It was a defeat that caused a blame game going on in Ukraine, particularly between volunteer battalions and the Ukrainian command. The Ukrainians' morale, which was on the rise after weeks of advances, was significantly degraded. On August 30th, the separatists claimed the capture of Volnoveka, along with several towns around Mariupol which essentially meant that Ukraine had lost control over a territory linking Donetsk to Mariupol. On August 31st, they launched assaults on both Donetsk and Luhansk airports, taking the latter under their control. They followed this by capturing towns on the H-21 highway south of Luhansk between Heohivka and Malomikolaivka, eliminating the immediate threat to Luhansk. The separatists and Russian forces also expanded their area of control around Holivka and Mariupol. As a result, the direct Russian involvement in the war and setbacks of the Ukrainian army pushed the Ukrainian government towards a diplomatic solution. On August 26th, Poroshenko and Putin met face to face in Minsk, a meeting which followed up on all previous negotiations within the Normandy format consisting of Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany, along with talks between representatives of Ukraine and the separatists. On September 5th, 
The sides agreed to a ceasefire after the Trilateral Contact Group, consisting of Ukraine, Russia and OSCE representatives, signed the first Minsk Protocol. Along with an immediate ceasefire, which was going to be monitored by the OSCE, Ukraine agreed to decentralization of power in Donetsk and Luhansk blasts, promising them a special status under Kyiv's jurisdiction. Local elections in Donbass, conducted by Ukraine under international observation, amnesty for all combatants, and a humanitarian and reconstruction program for the region. The agreement also stipulated removal of all illegal armed groups and mercenaries from Donbass and the creation of a buffer zone on the Ukraine-Russia border. On paper, everything looked acceptable for Ukraine. Ukraine was going to restore its territorial integrity, sans Crimea, in exchange for some level of autonomy for Donetsk and Luhansk blasts. Moreover, the Ukraine-Russia border was going to be demilitarized. And yet Putin has never been known for honoring international treaties. Another problem for Kyiv was that Russia was not recognized as a party to this conflict, but as a mediator of some sort. The ceasefire collapsed pretty quickly, as both sides continued shelling each other, while on September 29th, the GPR separatists and Russian troops launched their second assault on the Donetsk International Airport, after a particularly long period of shelling, to start the longest battle of this war. The 93rd Mechanized Brigade and Volunteer Battalions could not stop the Russian troops and the DPR's Vostok, Somali and Sparta battalions from breaching the perimeter of the airport, as they gained a foothold on the eastern edge of the airport. The next goal was to capture the old terminal of the airport. By mid-October, the separatists captured most of the old terminal and managed to establish positions in the new terminal. Soon, the new terminal became the main battleground. The new terminal, which was completed in 2011 to host tourists travelling to Donetsk for the 2012 European Football Championship, used to be a seven-storey building. But only three floors were standing by the time the mixed group of Russian forces and separatists gained a foothold there. They occupied the first two floors of the new terminal, while the Ukrainians controlled the third floor, along with the air traffic control tower. Throughout November, the separatists and Russians focused on attacking Ukrainian defenders. Elements of the 79th, 80th and 95th Airborne Brigades were sent to reinforce the defenders of the airport, who had been fighting under extremely hard conditions. Despite cold weather and lack of power, they were standing their ground. Due to their fierce resistance, one of the separatists called them cyborgs, and this moniker soon spread among the Ukrainian public. The defenders of the Donetsk airport became known as the cyborgs of Donetsk airport. But the superior firepower of the Russian army and its proxies gradually made any resistance impossible. The remaining Ukrainian forces in the old terminal had to retreat to the new terminal by early December, simply because there was not much cover remaining for them there. Separatists were also regularly targeting Piski, a small town adjacent to the airport, which was key to its defense as a supply base and the supply route to the airport, making it extremely difficult to transfer supplies and evacuate wounded fighters. On January 10th, the separatists launched another assault. Two days later, one of the last remaining strongholds of the Ukrainian forces in the airport, the air traffic control tower, collapsed after months of non-stop shelling. The DPR battalions also captured the third floor of the new terminal by then. On January 13th, the separatists issued an ultimatum to Ukrainian units demanding they give up the defense of the airport. In a last-ditch attempt to turn the tide, exhausted Ukrainian soldiers launched a surprise counter-offensive and regained ground in the airport, but this did not change the ultimate result. On January 19th, Russia sent 600 soldiers, additional tanks and artillery, and a contingent of special forces to the airport. The final blow came two days later, when the Russian special forces conducted an explosion on the top floor of the new terminal, dropping it onto the Ukrainian defenders on the second floor. The remaining Ukrainians had to flee, and many were captured. The spirited defense of the Donetsk International Airport was something similar to the defense of Azovstal in 2022, but the ultimate result was the same. The loss of the airport led to the establishment of a new line of contact along Piski, Opitna and Avdivka, which has not changed dramatically even after the start of the full-scale invasion by Putin in 2022. Towards the end of the Battle of the Donetsk Airport, the situation was also escalating elsewhere in Donbass. Another meeting within the framework of the Normandy format between leaders of Russia, Ukraine, Germany and France did not lead to anything meaningful. 
On January 14th, Russian battalion tactical groups and separatist formations started shelling Debout Sever, another key communication hub of Donbass between Donetsk and Luhansk. At the time, it was a salient of control by the Ukrainian army, which separatists needed to take under control to secure another line of communication in Donbass. Ukraine stationed around 8,000 troops in the Debout Sever salient from the 128th Mechanized Brigade and the Donbass Volunteer Battalion. Heavy shelling resulted in the loss of water, heating and power in the city, making the situations of the Debout Sever defenders even worse. After days of shelling, the separatists attempted a ground offensive on Debout Sever from Holivka on January 27th, but were repelled by the Ukrainian army. However, by late January, the separatists captured most of Volihersk, a town to the west of Debout Sever, diminishing the size of the Ukrainian-held salient and creating a further threat to the Ukrainian defenders in Debout Sever from the west. The Ukrainian attempt to retake Volihersk had failed. Still, Ukraine was in control of the MO3 highway, leading to its army headquarters in Bakhmut. But when the separatists captured Lovinova, the Ukrainian forces lost their last supply line to Debout Sever. They were in operational encirclement. The signing of the second Minsk agreement on February 12th, which was awfully similar to the first one, did not put a stop to the Battle of Debout Sever. There was no ceasefire there. Russia continued pounding Debout Sever to wear down its defenders and the highway linking the city to Bakhmut to prevent any reinforcements from coming into the battle. All Ukrainian attempts to retake the MO3 highway failed. The Russians and the separatists made their final blow on February 17th, when they conducted a ground assault on Debout Sever proper. On the following day, most of Debout Sever was captured by the separatists, and Ukrainian troops tried to retreat from the salient using dirt roads, only to be ambushed by the separatists, causing the destruction of many Ukrainian vehicles and the loss of over 100 soldiers. By February 20th, the last pockets of Ukrainian resistance in Debout Sever were defeated. After the Battle of Debout Sever, the war in Donbass mostly turned into a frozen conflict, like many others in the former Soviet Union. The sides had been shelling each other regularly, and small-scale battles would happen occasionally, with minor changes in territorial control on the ground, until Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022. There were several diplomatic talks, which did not lead to any resolution, simply because Russia had no plans to see this war resolved peacefully. In 2021, more than 100,000 Russian soldiers were deployed to the border with Ukraine, as shelling in Donbass escalated significantly. Russia used Annex Crimea and occupied Donbass as a staging ground for the full-scale attack on Ukraine. The rest is tragic history that is currently unfolding before our eyes. The war in Donbass led to many military and civilian casualties, with the vast majority killed before March 2015, when the Battle of Debout Sever ended. According to Ukraine, 4,490 of their soldiers died in this war by December 2021. The December 2021 estimate of the OHCHR was that 3,404 civilians had died during the course of the conflict. The death toll of separatists and Russian troops participating in the war was assessed at 6,500. 1.6 million Ukrainians became IDPs. The war also created a grey zone in Donbass, making the lives of people living in this region harder. Economic relations with the rest of Ukraine became practically frozen, while Russian-backed proxy republics were essentially ruled by dictatorial regimes akin to Russia, with human rights violations becoming a common occurrence. Even prior to the full-scale invasion, it was next to impossible for foreigners to visit the occupied areas. Ukrainians could only visit if they had relatives in the area and they had to travel through Russia. Expressing any pro-Ukrainian sentiment could be punished, while refusing to donate to the government was often seen as a lack of loyalty. According to numerous witnesses, being accused of treason could lead to detention in concentration camp-like facilities. The economic situation worsened following the outbreak of the war as well. Until late 2014, Ukraine maintained economic relations with its citizens in Donbass. People living there were still eligible to receive pensions and other types of social support in Donbass, while Ukraine was buying coal from the breakaway region. But as the first Minsk Accord collapsed and the line of contact between Ukraine and the separatist entities emerged, the Ukrainian government started preparing for a new reality of frozen conflict in Donbass. 
on the 15th of November 2014, Poroshenko signed a decree stipulating that Ukraine would shut down all its institutions in the occupied areas, while people living there would have to receive their pensions and social support payments in territories controlled by Kyiv. Ukraine followed this policy up by establishing seven checkpoints along the line of contact to prevent uninterrupted travel between Ukraine and its occupied territories in the east. Still, Ukraine maintained some level of economic relations with the separatist entities until in the spring of 2017, Kyiv imposed an economic embargo under public pressure, particularly as the Ukrainian government was criticized by war veterans and rights groups for the blood trade with the Russian proxy republics. Ukraine banned any economic exchange with the so-called DPR and LPR, and as a result, their industrial production suffered. But Russia was not going to let its puppet regimes go bankrupt anyway, and supported them throughout their existence. Therefore, many analysts believe that instead of harming the separatist regimes, the blockade harmed Kyiv's reintegration strategy and its reputation among the people living under occupation. Ukraine continued paying pensions and social payments, but people living in occupied regions had to travel to Ukrainian-controlled areas to collect them and register there every two months. Otherwise, their pensions and social payments would be frozen. The Ukrainian government wanted to ensure their citizens in the occupied Donbass demonstrated their loyalty and kept in contact with their mother nation to get their state payments. The situation worsened during the pandemic, as the separatist authorities got their excuse to cut any communication and travel to Ukraine, closing down checkpoints on the line of contact. Even though people in Donbass could still travel to Russia. Before the pandemic, residents of Donbass would regularly travel to Ukrainian-controlled areas to collect their state payments, and for the simplest of purposes, like buying groceries due to lower prices there. For instance, in August 2019, 1.5 million people from Donbass crossed the line of contact. While Ukraine tried to find a balance between rejecting the legality of separatist entities on its territories and maintaining relations with its citizens living there, Russia simply treated the breakaway regions as its provinces and supported them financially. In April 2019, residents of unrecognized republics were given an opportunity to obtain Russian citizenship with a fast-track procedure, the move they've used in other separatist regimes of the former Soviet Union. After all, it would create a perfect excuse for the Kremlin. If Ukraine would launch military operations to liberate its occupied territories in Donbass, Russia could claim to be defending its citizens there and send in its troops openly, like it did later. The only punishment that Russia faced for starting a war in Donbass was sanctions imposed by the USA and the EU, which were not nearly as sweeping as they became after the full-scale invasion in 2022. Ukraine would only get non-lethal equipment and military training from its Western allies until 2018, when the United States finally decided to send small arms and javelin anti-tank weapons clearly not offensive weapons. The Western reaction to the war in Donbass was inadequate, as the policy of appeasement and non-confrontation eventually did nothing to stop Russia. The control of Donbass and Crimea was not enough for Putin, who grossly miscalculated by launching a full-scale invasion, thinking that Ukraine of 2022 would be the same country as Ukraine of 2014. More videos on the war in Ukraine are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.